seminar. And for the first time, we are going virtual. So welcome. My name is Sarah Small, and I will be your host today. And I have the privilege to be with you this morning and to welcome our speaker, Danielle Bean. And um, I will introduce her shortly. But before I do, I've got a few things I want to cover off on. First, a really big thank you to Father Steve Marsh and Father Tom Ferreira, from the uh, Erie Shores Catholic Family of Parishes who allowed us to tap into their live stream mass from Kingsville. And uh, I believe there was even a little effort to uh, get the technical part started and we're really thankful for that. And thank Father Steve for his uh, mention of us and uh, mentioning us in the prayers of the faithful. I'm sure that uh, our seminar will benefit from that additional prayer. Another, I just want to also mention our awesome communications coordinator, Adam, who's behind the scenes, Adam Helmers. I'm always very confident when I know you're back there uh, making everything run smoothly, at least from our end. So thank you for that. Um, some of you may know me. Um, I know many of the women's names that are on this list and I'm just a registration. I'm just so excited to be here with you. Uh, for those who don't know me, again, I'm Sarah and I work with FFI, um, Family Foundations Institute where I help organize various events and initiatives. And uh, I'm so pleased to be with you today and connect in this way. Um, uh, I'm encouraged just to know that there's this many women who are gathered looking forward to uh, a morning together of formation and growth. In fact, we have nearly 100 women uh, registered and signed in for this day. And I think that's just wonderful. I wanna commend all of you for uh, carving out some time from a busy Saturday morning to um, invest in your own well-being and formation and I hope you've been able to find a special little nook or cranny in your home to uh, find that space uh, sit down get your get your feet up and uh, be enriched by our speaker and just by being together a uh, little bit of housekeeping um, first of all our schedule is going to be uh, Danielle's going to offer us a 20-minute talk and uh, then we'll have a brief uh, intermission um, Danielle will offer a second 20 minute talk after I've shared a little bit about FFI with you today. And then we get to present Danielle with some questions. Uh, some of you have already submitted questions earlier on. And so we're really looking forward to uh, delivering them to Danielle and hearing her responses. And uh, finally, we're going to wrap up the, um, the talks at 1130 and then say the rosary. And I think that's a really special thing to get to do this Easter Saturday. So I'm looking forward to that. I also get the fun of drawing some uh, names out of a hat or a basket to hand out six uh, books, Danielle Bean titled books. And we're really looking forward to delivering those to you. So we'll do that at the intermission. So a little uh, housekeeping item, a chat bar on YouTube. I can see some people are already uh, participating in it. Uh, I'd like you to uh, feel free to use that. Um, you can uh, send in your Q&A questions in advance. We'll be watching for it. And uh, I think it'd be really cool since we're, I'm excited to know who all has joined in and, and where you're calling in from. Uh, I really encourage you to use your chat bar right now and let us know uh, who's there with you or uh, what town you're calling in from. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll see some familiar names. I'm sure it'll start coming hopefully. Um, and, and I'll be watching for that. At FFI, one of our main aims is to build these connections and friendships. And uh, during this year of the pandemic, I mean, it's an understatement to say we may have felt restricted in these ways of connecting in with each other, but this morning is a great opportunity to do so. And I uh, really encourage you to check out that chat bar, see who's there. Maybe you recognize a name or a friend you haven't connected with in a while and uh, go out and go ahead and reach out to her, maybe chat to see how the morning was for her and uh, just to see how they're doing. Um, okay, so we've got some names coming in here. Um, Enjoying to see that uh, Chatham, St. Thomas. Uh, great. Here we go. Brights Grove. Wonderful. Welcome, everyone. So be sure to use that chat bar uh, throughout the day, and it's our way of staying connected with you. Awesome. 
Okay, so without any more delay, I would like to welcome our speaker, Danielle Bean. You have likely read Danielle's biography and possibly heard her speak at virtual conferences this past year, especially. Uh, Danielle is probably best known as the host and creator of the Girlfriends podcast, and she is also the co-host of The Gist on Catholic TV. She is a wife and a mother of eight, and we are really honored and thrilled to have Danielle here with us today. Welcome, Danielle. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Thank you. It's so great. It really is great. And uh, we're just excited to have this close connection with you, Danielle. And I think everyone is uh, really looking forward, especially to the live Q&A um, after we hear your, your talk. So we'll, we'll be sending in lots of questions. I love that. I love that. I love for it to be interactive. That's great. Very awesome. The first thing before we get into your talk, um, when I read that bio, your mom, eight kids, uh, when did you get in, involved in speaking, <laughs> podcasting, or even writing books? Perhaps you can let us know. How did that all start? Sure. Well, I think, you know, the writing came first. That was, I've always just been a writer, even when I was just, you know, writing in my own journals and squirreling them away all through my, you know, teenage years and young adult years. But, um, you know, when I, I got married right out of college and um, we started our family right away. And like you said, we have eight kids and they're all in succession there. So um, life was busy, and but I got around to doing some freelance writing work when I was pregnant with our fifth, which seems like a crazy time to just start a new, you know, career path, <laughs> so-called. But it was a, a time where I had like a set amount of time and I felt like I could devote to that. And um, it really just grew from there. And what I found was that through the writing, I came to connect with people about the things we truly care about most, you know, our faith and our family and um, some of the things that we women really connect with each other about. And that became a really important thing for me um, doing that. But then, you know, through the writing, making that connection naturally leads to other forms of media, especially in today's world. And, you know, the, the writing led to me getting into publishing and different kinds of publishing, magazine publishing. I was involved in Catholic Digest for so many years. I don't, I'm no longer doing that. But what I found at that point, at, at that point in my work was that I felt a little more removed from that personal connection with other people. And that really drew me back toward this ministry of, of speaking, which which made me think, okay, now blogs were a thing once upon a time, and I used to do that. And that was a personal connection, and they're still there in some ways. But um, I really was looking for that personal connection. That led me to starting the Girlfriends podcast because – that's that's how I connect, and I, there's it really is an intimate connection. As weird as it is to say that, where um, I'm just talking, you know, a lot of times I'll record sitting in my car. You know, it's just me and our, my driveway here in New Hampshire, and yet I find it such a personal connection because I I know I feel that with podcasts I listen to, like you put those earbuds in, that person is speaking to you, and truly that is what my goal is with all my different things that I do with with my ministry. Are is really just I want to connect with other women heart to heart about the things that we really care about. And I, I want to be a source of encouragement and support and the kind of encouragement and support, especially that we women can only get from one another. I think that's so incredibly valuable. And that's why I'm excited that you're doing this event today, that you're rolling with the punches, you're doing a virtual conference and uh, just looking for the ways that you can still make that really important connection among women. That's awesome, Danielle. It's everything everything we're hoping to do uh, in this morning and, uh, and at FFI as well. So um, I, I so look forward to hearing from you and I, I look forward to those Q&A questions because um, many of our, uh, our registrants and uh, friends, when we've listened to that Girlfriends podcast, I think it's that, uh, that close um, vulnerability and sharing of ideas and, uh, and helping each other that uh, we're drawn to. So, well, without further ado then, Danielle, I, uh, I welcome you to uh, begin your first talk. And um, of course, Danielle is going to be exploring the themes in, in her book, You're Worth It. And uh, her first talk is entitled At the Well, Jesus Waits for You. So thank you, Danielle. Can't wait. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I, I just want to start today by thanking each of you. Thank you for being here. Like Sarah said, that we're, we're just grateful for your presence. We're grateful for your participation. I know 
that family life is busy. Maybe your work life is busy. We're all doing so many and, and we're doing so many important things. So we are all balancing different priorities, but I want to thank you for making this event a priority on your Saturday morning, because that really encourages me personally. It really encourages me that you're doing that, that you're making that commitment to taking some time for connecting with other women, taking some time to feed your own faith life. I think that is so vitally important important. And maybe you're not so much in the habit of doing that. This might be an unusual circumstance for you where you're taking a little bit of quiet. And my hope and my prayer is that this, this taking of this time will, will feed you in a way that encourages you to make that more of a regular habit. Find ways in your days that you can make that habit of daily quiet, daily prayer, daily connection with the Lord, even if we're talking about just taking five minutes. But I'm so grateful to you for devoting this morning to this task of connecting with one another, but then also going deeper inside of your faith life. We need that more than ever. We need connection with one another more than ever. And I'm so grateful for technology, which allows us to be able to do this in this way. You know, I was thinking back at the start of this morning to went way back when Sarah and I first ever communicated about me coming. It was a supposed to be me coming there and meeting you in person. And I, I pray that that can happen at some point in the future. But I'm so grateful for the fact that we're able to do this, that we're able to connect anyway in the ways that make sense. And, you know, Jesus tells us in the gospels that wherever two or three are gathered in my name, that he's there in our midst. And so he's here present today. Like, is Jesus on Zoom? Is, is Jesus on YouTube? Yes. Yes, he is. He's present here today. And he has a message that he wants to speak to you. So my prayer and my hope is that you will open up your heart today and allow that space for Jesus to speak to you. Allow that time, allow the quiet to enter in and just take some of that time to just prayerfully open yourself up to what Jesus might want to be speaking to you. And so this these talks that I'm sharing here today, as Sarah shared with you, are based on themes in my book, You're Worth It. And the subtitle is Change the Way You Feel About Yourself by Discovering How Jesus Feels About You. And so that really is the theme that I want to share with you here today, that our relationship with Jesus is a life-changing thing and that we need to be open to the ways in which he wants to connect with us. And the ways that he wants to connect with us are deeply personal. They're intimate. It's a close kind of friendship that he desires to have with us, which is an astonishing thing for our God to want that personal connection with each of us to, to wait for us in the way that he does. So we're talking about Jesus waiting. And so in this book, You're Worth It, I explore themes of women in the New Testament, looking at the stories of these real women who lived, you know, thousands of years ago. And we look at their stories and consider what relevance do these stories have for our lives today? What message about God's unique love for women can we pull away from these stories? And as we go through these stories, and as I share them in the book, you know, so the themes we're talking about here today, they all are treated in much greater depth inside of my book. But I, what I want to share with you today are just a few of these stories. I want to look at a few of these stories of women in the New Testament. Real women, I've always been fascinated by this, which is why I wrote the book in the first place. Women who like walked alongside Jesus, who heard his voice, who were touched by his hands, who sat in his presence and learned from him. Real women that he healed, that he touched, that he taught. This is really a beautiful thing for us as women to reflect on. And whenever we read the gospels, God invites us to place ourselves in those stories, to find our place there and really envision ourselves as present inside of these stories because he has a message he wants to speak to you, a unique and personal message that he wants to speak to you inside of these stories that we read in the New Testament. So the first one that I want to dive into here is about the woman at the well, which of course is such a, a familiar story, the Samaritan woman at the well that Jesus met. Um, but inside of this session, I want, I want to share with you three, three ideas, three main ideas that we can take away from this story. So uh, first, Jesus seeks you where you are. And second, Jesus does not care about your labels. And third, Jesus connects with you through your shared humanity. So we're going to look at each of those, those points a little bit further here. But um, so first, let's just read the opening of this, this story that we read. And this is in uh, John chapter four. 
um, where, where Jesus meets the woman at the well. It says, he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sikar near the plot of land that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired from his journey, sat down there at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. All right, let's pause there. So this is the beginning of this meeting between Jesus and this woman. And so first, if you're familiar with this passage, it's a lengthy passage. It is a long conversation that is recorded here in the Gospel of John. And yet we don't know this woman's name. All these details of their conversation and the back and forth between them, we know, but we don't know her name. And I think that has deep meaning for us as women. I think we are meant to understand that this woman, though she was a real woman who had this real interaction with Jesus, who is real, um, that she's a representative of all of us. We're all meant to see ourselves in this conversation. We're all meant to participate in this conversation with Jesus, that it's deeply personal and that God wants us to read this story in this way. He has a message that he wants to speak to us through this story. And so focusing on Jesus meets you where you are, how do we see that? So here in this story, Jesus meets this woman at the well where she was. What is she doing? She's going to the water to draw well. I'm going to the well to draw water. She's meeting her family's needs. And, you know, many of us don't go to wells to draw water every day for our family's needs, but We women are doing the lion's share of the the feeding and the caring for our families in some of those most basic ways for the the people in our households, you know, preparing meals, going grocery shopping, cleaning up afterwards, all of that. Uh, That's a large part of many women's lives. And these are the everyday chores that we participate in. And here's Jesus meeting this woman who doesn't even know who he is, right? She's an outsider. She's a foreigner. She's, she's not a Jew. And so he meets her here in this, this place where she's going about her everyday chores. He, he's waiting for her. This is what I find so fascinating in this story that he's sitting there and he's just waiting for her because he knows she's going to come there. He's waiting to have this conversation with her. And I think the message for us inside of that is that we don't have to go outside of our lives to meet Jesus. Sometimes we think that, right? We think I'm so busy. I'm doing all of my chores. I've got all of these responsibilities. These things are important for me to do. I'm the only one who can do these, you know, with your kids or caring for your parents or in your workplace or whatever it is you've got that's filling your life with busyness that, you know, we can feel like that pulls us away from God. But the truth is that God is waiting for us right there inside of those things. He waits for us inside of our everyday chores, our everyday routines, He's sitting there at the well, whatever you're doing, Jesus is there. He's in the people that he calls on us to serve. And sometimes we, we tend to like separate our, our spiritual lives where, okay, I can have this time in the morning for prayer and then that's it. And then, you know, everything else is compartmentalized. Then I'm focused on work. Then I'm focused on the kids. Then I'm focused on, you know, meals or whatever it is that you've got that are your responsibilities. But God truly wants us to see that he's present in every moment of our days. Yes, of course, it's important to have that time that's set aside for prayer, um, but he continues to be present to us. And this is so important for us because we women, we have an active vocation. You know, we're not, most of us, called to the contemplative life of a nun locked away in a convent. We're doing important things and our families need us to do the important things. Our church needs us to do the important things. Our world needs us to be doing those important things. Thanks be to God, we are doing those things. But God wants us to see that he is there present and he's waiting for us inside of our everyday lives. And sometimes we make it more complicated than it needs to be. We'll say like, I've got to figure out what God's will is. I need to discern what God's will is. Well, I mean, God's will for you, it's... It's right there in front of you. Who are the people in your life that God gave you to love and serve today? Who are the people you're meeting? Whether it's a chance meeting with a stranger at the supermarket or whether it's your own kid in your living room, who are you meeting today? God is speaking to you through those everyday things, that everyday work that you are doing. He is waiting for you there. You don't have to get fancy to meet Jesus. It doesn't have to just be on your knees in prayer in the chapel, as important as those things can be. That's not the only place where Jesus is. He lies waiting for us inside of our everyday chores. And then I love how Jesus greets this woman. What does he say to her? Give me a drink. 
Isn't that beautiful? So simple. He's meeting her on her own terms. He knows. He knows that every woman has in her heart this gift of hospitality, of loving service to others, this gift of compassion and sensitivity being aware of the needs of others. We have these unique unique gifts as women as part of our, our feminine genius that St. John Paul II talks so beautifully about. And so he knows that and he's looking to meet her on her terms in a way that he doesn't come to her and say, behold, I'm the, the, the Messiah, you know, like worship me, right? No, he, that, he knows that she's human and she has these human needs and she has this very human and feminine way of interacting. And he's meeting her right there where she is saying, give me a drink. And he's saying the same to each of us. Give me a drink. Meet me in my shared humanity. And I always find this is fascinating too, that Jesus got thirsty. Isn't this amazing? Like God walked the earth and got tired and hungry and hot and thirsty. That's how he humbled himself to be able to meet us inside of that vulnerability, to be able to say to this woman, give me a drink. And he comes to us as a baby, as a baby, a vulnerable baby in the story of the nativity. We, this is like the most astonishing thing to reflect on that our God became a vulnerable, helpless baby so that we might meet him on our terms in our humanity, that it might make sense for us to connect with him. He wants that very personal connection and he makes himself vulnerable in that way. All right, so we need to talk about the fact that Jesus doesn't care about your labels. So what do I mean by that? So here in this story, we read also in John chapter four, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. And the woman said, answered and said to him, I do not have a husband. Jesus answered her, you are right in saying, I do not have a husband for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now, isn't this just like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, imagine this conversation. Imagine how her head must've been spinning. Like, who is this guy, right? How does he know all of this about me? And yet every one of us is called to see ourselves in this story. Now, you may or may not have had five husbands, but we all have our background story. And what is this telling us about this woman? She's got all these things that are working against her. How astonishing this is, right? She's a Samaritan. The Jews have nothing in common with the Samaritans. She's a woman that, you know, teachers weren't supposed to teach women. They weren't supposed to talk to women. They weren't supposed to touch women. This was a tough time to be a woman in, in Jesus's time. And then now we know she's a sinner. This is what becomes apparent inside of this story. So now we know why she was going to the well at noontime when it would have been in the hottest time of the day. It was to avoid interactions with other people. Other people would, all the other women of her community would have gone to the well early in the morning to avoid the heat of the day. She was going at noontime because she didn't want those interactions because even among her own people, she was an outsider. She was considered a sinner. She felt like she didn't belong. She was avoiding that. And yet Jesus knew that. And so he waits for her there, there in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, he's waiting for her there. So these are these kinds of labels that she's carrying around that put limits on her interactions and on her connections with other people, God included. And now you may not share the same labels as this woman, but I think it is so vitally important that we reflect on what, what labels are and what our labels are that we might be putting on ourselves that limit our connection with God. In what ways might we consider ourselves unworthy of a connection with God, of Jesus's love? In what ways do we put limits on that by labeling, labeling ourselves in certain ways? So, you know, Jesus doesn't care about these labels. And so once we think about what our labels might be, there might be things that you think like, okay, I can't be, you know, this, this good Catholic wife. I can't be this good Catholic mother. I can't be the good Catholic person in my workplace or member of my community because, and go ahead, fill in your blank. What is it? Because I'm divorced, because I'm wounded, because I'm a victim, because I'm hurt, because I'm broken because I'm a loser, because I'm a failure, because I'm lazy, because I'm stupid. What are these things that you listen to in your own mind? What are the voices that you listen to that label you in a way that you think limits your relationship with God, that you can't get there, that you can't have that connection with God? Because I'm here to tell you this story 
shows us that Jesus doesn't care about those labels. He reaches out and wants to touch you anyway. He loves you anyway. He knows all about it the same way he knew all the details of this woman's life. He knows all the details of your life, all the details of your past, the ways in which you struggle, the ways in which you're broken, the ways in which you're wounded and hurting. He knows and it doesn't limit him. He reaches out to this woman. I mean, this is unheard of. Like this is a momentous occasion where this is the first time in the gospels that Jesus reveals himself as the Messiah to somebody. And who did he do it to? Did he go find a powerful politician or a king or some other important rabbi to tell about this? No, he went and he found somebody who by her own standards and by the standards of her own people was a nobody, a throwaway, who had those labels put on her. That's who he chose to reach out to and honor and have this connection with. He sought her out. He was waiting for her because that's how deeply he loved her and wanted to connect with her. And he seeks you out and he is waiting for you, regardless of what labels you might put on yourself to try to limit that out of a sense of insecurity, out of a sense of fear of what that connection with God might be like, out of a sense of unworthiness, feeling unworthy. He doesn't care about those labels. Jesus does not care about your labels. I want to invite you today to reflect on what, what are some of those words that you might use to describe yourself, that you maybe even do out loud, say out loud to describe yourself, that you think limit God's capacity to love you. And remember that Jesus doesn't care about them the same way he didn't care about this woman's labels. He speaks to her the truth about her life. He doesn't tell her it's not a problem. And yet he loves her anyway. He calls her anyway. He wants to connect with her anyway. And the same is true of his relationship with you. He's looking to do the same with you. And so when we think about some of the ways that women are disrespected today, I think that really Jesus's actions here in choosing a woman for this unique honor to play this role in salvation history, to have this long conversation with her recorded in the gospels for all time, that speaks volumes about how Jesus values us as women regardless of what our culture and our society and our world might tell us, there are so many ways women are disrespected because they are women in our world today. They're abused or through pornography or prostitution. There are ways that women are abused and rejected in our culture, even subtle ways outside of the outright obvious abuse of things like pornography, but even inside of our own relationships, even inside of a culture that tells us that we're not worthy if we don't look a certain way, if we don't have a certain amount of money, if we don't have certain social status, if we don't wear that kind of clothing. There's a world that tells us that we're not worthy if we don't have those things. And yet Jesus tells us otherwise. He speaks to this woman. He gives her this honor. And in a way, he gives honor to every woman because of that, because of making that choice to choose this woman to speak to. So there's so many ways that we're, we're wounded or we're angry and yet Jesus wants to connect with us. So that's the third point, that he wants to connect with us through our shared humanity. And this is so important. So we already talked about the growing thirsty, right? And I think inside of this, Jesus is inviting us to consider the ways in which we might be thirsty. We might be longing for him. He speaks to this woman of living water and says, if you drink this, you'll never thirst again. And at first she's like, give me that. That sounds great. I never want to have to come to this well again. But then he brings her to a greater understanding that he's talking about something spiritual here. And yet inside of that, we are invited to see that our physical needs, the ways that we, we long for things, we, we crave things, we're thirsty, we're hungry, we're tired, we're looking for rest. We're looking for fulfillment. Those physical needs mirror spiritual ones. That we're thirsty, we're hungry, we're longing for God. Like St. Augustine reminds us, our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. And Jesus knows that. And he knows it's through our shared humanity that he can invite us to see that he is going to meet our every need, that he wants to meet our every need. And he wants that personal, real connection with us. Not Jesus, who's a storybook character, in a story long ago that has little relevance to our lives today, not Jesus as a statue at church that you kneel in front of. Jesus as a real person, a man, a human, wants a human connection with us. He wants that personal friendship with us. 
and that personal intimate connection that we all long for inside of our human connections. He wants nothing less from you. That's what he's looking for. And he's looking to share inside of our shared humanity, connect with us in those deeply meaningful ways. So those are the three points that I wanted to make inside of looking at this gospel passage of the woman at the well. So first of all, that Jesus seeks you where you are and Jesus doesn't care about your labels. This is how we all feel seen and known and loved when someone knows us, truly knows us and loves us anyway. When they know our mess, when they know our details and they love us anyway, that's how Jesus loves you. That's how he wants you to feel known and loved. So he seeks you where you are. He doesn't care about your labels and he wants to connect with you through your shared humanity. And I'm gonna close out this session just by inviting you. We're gonna spend one moment in quiet here. I'm gonna ask you inside of this moment of quiet reflection to just begin thinking in your mind and maybe not even thinking anything in particular, quiet yourself. Allow yourself to experience quiet and silence and invite, invite God in. Invite him to speak a message to you. Invite Jesus to tell you what he most wants you to know right now. So we're going to spend a little moment in quiet and then a few lines of prayer. In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of this day, for this time together. We praise you for the gift of every woman who's here present during this live session and those who are gonna watch the recorded version later. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of each woman who's here. Open our hearts to be receptive to one another and to hear your message of love and understanding. Help us to be feel known, help us to feel seen, heard and understood in the way that only you can. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, We're so thankful for that talk. There's so much in there that just resonates with um, our hearts, our our women's hearts and our circumstances. And uh, I think especially thank you for those moments of silence at the end there where uh, what you've said can just kind of soak in. Um, uh, to the participants, I forgot to mention at the beginning of this day, but we will be recording or we are recording this event and then share with you that presentation after the day is finished. So um, perhaps you want to jot down an idea or a resolution or something that really jumped out at you. And I think that's a really great thing to make this day um, uh, stick or fruitful, but I want to encourage you, the, re- the recording will be available to you if you want to revisit some of those things that you heard. So just to, to let you know that. Um, so this is the moment where we're going to give you just a five minute break, um, where you can get up and stretch, uh, and do whatever, uh, for those of you who have tucked yourselves away in your home and you don't want the rest of your household to figure out where you are, maybe you don't want to get up. I'm not sure, but <laughs> take a moment here. We'll, uh, sign off for, or I will just, um, be, uh, paused or whatever for a break five minutes and then I'll be back um, in five minutes to just chat a little bit uh, with you about FFI and uh, do our first book draw. Okay, thank you. All right, everyone, welcome back. I hope everyone was able to uh, get up, move around, or stretch your legs. 
Um, the first thing I'd like to do is just the fun uh, draw, the uh, draw three names from a basket uh, for three Danielle Bean books. So the first one I have to offer is a You're Worth It hardcover book. And uh, we will be shipping these out after, um, after the weekend to the winners. I've got You're Worth It. I have a uh, nice leather bound uh, manual for women by Danielle. And the final one is You Are Enough, which I think is a similar to You're Worth It. And we explore um, Old Testament figures of women in, in the Old Testament, which is beautiful, beautiful again. So those three books I have to give away. And I have in here a basket of the names of all the uh, participants. So you will see that I'm here on my own, but I will just grab them. And, uh, and then I will be sure to ship these three books to you. So the first one is... Fiona Mendez. Congratulations, Fiona. We will be sending that your way, one of those books. Next name is Beatrice Shaken. Beatrice, congratulations. A book will be coming your way. Final one for this session is Joyce Lamb. So congratulations, Joyce. We will be getting that to you as well. Those three books, looking forward to sending them out. And, uh, and then, of course, share it with a friend when you're done. <laughs> um, just at this time, while we're gathered here again, uh, connecting with each other, uh, we know Danielle's coming back to guide us in some more uh, very beautiful thoughts. I want to share a little bit with you about FFI um, and what we're up to. Uh, in order to register for the event, you would have checked out a little bit our website or uh, the Facebook page. And I really encourage you to do that, invite you to do that. There's lots of family strengthening initiatives that we have on the go. Um, and uh, perhaps in your scanning of the website, there's something you think that could be helpful or important to yourself or your family. Uh, but bear in mind, your friends or a coworker, um, it's so great if we can share these resources and that's really, that's where, what we are here for. And we really want you to be able to uh, utilize what we've got. Our mission at FFI is to connect, encourage, and inform through various events and initiatives with the vision that families are the building block of society and that stronger families make a stronger world. So today, in this little way, we want to connect, encourage, and inform women. And uh, this uh, nearly 100 women, we want everyone to be able to go back and the uh, family that they are a part of, uh, sister, sisters, um, spouse, uh, the family, their daughters, they can all go back and we can hopefully strengthen um, ourselves and families around us, which is what we would love to contribute or, or help facilitate. One thing I want to share with you, just because it's uh, on my on my um, responsibility, I guess, here at FFI is summer camps, and I just want to assure you that we're doing what we can to uh, to make something happen this summer. The pandemic does uh, present for, um, get, I guess, uncertainty or just not sure, uh, wait and see kind of um, a situation. But I want to assure you, we're working on things. Uh, FFI, we really believe that a family or a camping situation is just such a wonderful place to uh, go close to nature. Drive close to God, uh, build beautiful friendships and strengthen families. So it's really on our heart to make something happen. I want to assure you of that. Okay, the final thing I just wanted to really draw your attention to today is, uh, is our mental wellness outreach at FFI. So at FFI, we really believe strongly that mental wellness is critical to building up strong families and the wellness, that the wellness of each member of the family really impacts the wellness of the entire family. So we've got a tremendous coordinator of mental wellness, Anne-Marie Pasella, and she herself is a practicing psychotherapist, but she also helps us in so many ways, sharing great resources about mental wellness and um, also writing her Psych Talk blog. We've had a few guest writers as well, but usually it's Anne-Marie writing. And we just want to be able to share those resources with you. There should be something um, along the chat bar, I think, an address that you can pop in and visit uh, after this is over. Um, just to visit what, what we've got there for mental wellness and just want to assure you that that is something we feel is very important, both for our own families um, and, and friends who may be uh, in need. And there's a further element, a tool that we offer, and it's a uh, contact form where you can contact directly into our coordinator, Anne-Marie, and um, provide a little bit of information where she can reach out to you and just help someone who may be at a place where they just are not sure on next steps where to go when it comes 
comes to mental wellness, a little bit of coaching, some shared resources, and even perhaps finding some help or counseling after that. So I really want to encourage you to check that out and just keep it in the back of your mind as a tool that can be a help to yourself or to a friend or a family member in need. Uh, we as women are just sensitive to those, the needs of the people around us. And I think we can be uh, quick to notice that there is a need and um, just want to encourage you to look at that. Um, so FFI, we are a registered charity. And so we do rely on the generosity of donors to keep uh, these and other initiatives going. So if you at all feel moved to do so, do check out our website or contact us to find um, ways that you could actually contribute financially to, to our organization. So thank you, thank you for that. And um, very soon here, I'm gonna welcome Danielle back on um, for her second talk, which again will be about 20 minutes. And um, Danielle, you're going to talk on, or we're gonna bring Danielle in here. Uh, Danielle's second talk is going to be Invitation, Jesus Calls to You. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah. And, you know, as you were sharing about everything, all the good things going on and the, the beautiful sources of support you have there at FFI, I think um, it, it's really important today that we reflect on the gift that community is for each of us and the different ways that we're called to participate in that community. I think we women need to be reminded that we need each other that we, we need the kind of unique support, encouragement, and affirmation that we can only get from one another. So, so many times, you know, we, inside of our female friendships, sometimes we, we experience challenges. There might be jealousy or competition or something along those lines, and, and that can pull us away, or we find ourselves comparing ourselves to other people, and that can pull us away from the beautiful gift that a community of women is meant to be, is supposed to be. And so I think I, I just want to encourage everybody to reflect on the ways in which you participate in this community and ways in which you might be called to participate even more, especially during this time when we're more socially isolated than ever. I think it's more important than, than ever that we follow our lady's example in the visitation where she ran to meet her cousin Elizabeth and be present for her in her time of need, that we're all called to be that for one another. And, and in a unique, unique way, women are called to play that role in each other's lives. Um, all right. So in this session, we're going to be talking about Jesus's invitation to us, that Jesus calls us. And again, we're going to be pulling themes from my book, You're Worth It, which is looking at stories in the New Testament and the real women that Jesus knew and talked with and touched and, and taught and what we can learn from those interactions. And once again, I'm going to invite you, as we reflect on some of these stories, to place yourself in the scene place yourself inside of these gospel stories and open your heart up to hearing what Jesus's unique message is to you. I don't know what it is. It's not a message for me. It's a message for you. And so I want you to think a little bit and reflect a little bit and pray. We'll, um, you know, we'll close again with a, a moment of quiet and prayer, but I just want that to be the beginning for you. I really, I want to encourage you to explore some of the themes we're going to talk about here today. Spend some real time reflecting on the ways in which Jesus is calling you, uniquely interrupting your life. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. So what kind of relationship do you think Jesus wants with you? Now, this is something maybe we don't think about enough. Like, what is he looking for? We were talking about that he wants to connect through our shared humanity. That, um, But sometimes we, we have this way out of perhaps insecurity or even out of a false idea of respect for God, of trying to keep a distance between ourselves and Jesus. And that's not what he wants at all. He wants a deeply personal, intimate relationship with you. He doesn't want a one-sided relationship. He wants to be connected with you, but he's he's not a pushy jerk. He's not going to like come in your life and, and force you to connect with him. He invites you and he goes first. I mean, look, what kind of relationship do you think Jesus wants with you? Well, we just went through, you know, the drama of Holy Week and watched as Jesus poured out his very self out of love for each person personally, for you personally, he did that. And that was to show just how much he loves us. So he went first in this dramatic, overwhelming, beautiful self gift. He showed us that and that's what he wants back from us. But it doesn't feel comfortable to start there perhaps for you. 
maybe you're not quite there yet. So let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about what that what that looks like in what ways he wants to interrupt you in your life and encourage you to have that connection with him. And so one of the stories I like to look at here is the, the story of Mary and Martha. And now we women, we love this story, don't we? I mean, this is like, this story is us. Like this is for us. Like these, these women, like this is Jesus talking to us about us. Okay. So this is such a vitally important story and I, I love it so much. And every one of us is Mary and is Martha in our own way, in our own experiences. And I want to encourage you to think a little bit about the ways in which you relate to each of these. Um, so it's very brief what we read here in the gospel of Luke. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a village and a woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister, Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. The Lord said to her in reply, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. One thing is needful. Mary has chosen the good portion which shall not be taken away from her. Now, if any of you grew up with a sister or if you have a close girlfriend, maybe you can picture and relate a little bit to the rivalry that's going on here, right? We can all understand. And so we can imagine that. And probably most of us can just relate to Martha. Like, seriously, she's doing all the work all by herself. And um, and, and then I just, I love though that our, our Lord in this moment, he interrupts her in her busyness, in her distraction, in her many things, as he calls them. And he, he speaks her name two times. So inside of that, what do we hear? We hear this gentleness. We hear love and compassion for her. He's not, you know, um, giving her a stern reprimand, but he is giving her a reprimand. He's telling her something. He's interrupting her. And so I, you can almost hear like the twinkle in his eye as he says her name two times that he just, he loves her. And he's speaking to her in this gentle way, but correcting her in a very real way. And I invite you to think about that. Think about Jesus connecting with her like that and open yourself up to hearing him saying your name like that. Hear Jesus say your name two times. That he wants to interrupt your life. He wants to speak to you. He wants to say your name just like that. Speak it into your heart. Speak it into your life. Interrupt all of your things, your many things. And, you know, I think it's, it's funny to reflect on what Martha's response might have been to this. Because imagine what she was thinking. Because if we read her words, she's very bold. I, I love this. You know, she's so brazen. She is so convinced that she is right and that what she's suffering is unjust and that her sister is being a selfish jerk and that Jesus needs to fix this. And how many times do we approach God in prayer in that way? Where we say, do you not care? Right? I like how she starts with that. And then follow up with, tell her to help me. How many times do we go to, to God in prayer like that? Either saying, do you not care? Or feeling that he doesn't care. And then following it up with telling him what to do. I know I do this. I, I struggle with this all the time. Sometimes I, you know, I'll go to prayer time and it feels like I'm running a board meeting because I've got my agenda. I've got, and then you're going to do this. And then you're going to have this person do this. And then you're going to have this work out in this precise way, right? This is what we do. And I mean, it's very human to do this and to begin to relate to God in that way. And if that's where you are, I'm, I'm not judging you. I am relating. I can understand it. But Jesus wants something more for you. He understands it too. And he's grateful that we're connecting, but he starts there, and, but he interrupts us. And imagine, imagine what, what Martha was thinking as he, as he tells her this, like, what? Like, um, what? What are you talking about? There's more important things than like the roast I have in the oven, right? Like, and, and what are your important things? What are the things that you feel are so important that you can't let go of them, that you can't let Jesus interrupt you in them? What things are you holding on to? What are you busy and distracted with? What are your many things that Jesus needs to remind you are not quite so important? So what is he inviting us to see here? What is he inviting Martha to see? But then speaking to every one of us, when he says your name two times like that, what is he inviting you to? What is he inviting you to see? That people are more important than things. 
that relationships are what we're built for. And it's inside of our relationship with God that we're going to find peace, joy, lasting fulfillment, and only there that these other things we're doing as good and as worthy as they are. And thanks be to God, busy women do all the things every day. We are a gift to our families, to our communities, to our church, to our neighborhoods, to our schools. We are so important with all the important things we're doing. And yet Jesus isn't telling us not to do it. He didn't tell Martha, don't ever wash another dish, but he's inviting her to see what's more important. And that is a relationship with him. So important that we see that. And, you know, I invite you to think about uh, the times in your life where you've maybe hosted an event, perhaps, and felt like Martha has felt. I know I have. I remember one time in particular, this was many years ago now, that um, my husband's coworkers and his boss came to dinner to our house for the first time. And it was very stressful, of course, for me. And I had every detail of the dinner planned out. I had everything timed precisely when, you know, we're going to serve these drinks and have this food and then the, use this tablecloth and all of that. I had all those details in order. And uh, I'll never forget that at the end of that evening, as well as all of my schedule went to plan and the food came out the way I wanted it to and all of that stuff worked out, I remember feeling as they were leaving and we were saying goodbye that it was the first time that I had looked many of them in the eyes the entire evening as we were saying goodbye. I had missed the whole point of inviting people over. I had missed the whole point of hospitality and connection because I was so busy and distracted. You know, that can any one of us. And we all experience that in different ways. But what I realized in that moment and what Jesus invites us to reflect on when we read this story is that our relationships are more important than any of this stuff that we are doing. Picture Mary as she is seated at his feet. What a beautiful image that is. Mary, who's chosen the better part. What is that better part? It's Jesus himself. It's the relationship with Jesus. That's what she's chosen to focus on, is her relationship with our Lord. She is seated at his feet. What a beautiful posture. What a beautiful thing to do and just be focused on him. All of that other stuff doesn't matter nearly so much as this thing that she's rooted in, which is a relationship with Jesus. And he's inviting each of us to do that. We don't have to give up all the things, all the important things, but we do need to have things in proper order. We do need to have our relationship with Jesus be at the center of our lives. All the other stuff is going to fall into place from there. It all comes into perspective from there. He's inviting us to see that, that we can choose that better part and it won't be taken away from us. He's inviting us to see that and, and reflect on the fact that, you know, the fact that we're busy and we're Martha and we're doing all the things in our lives doesn't mean that interiorly we cannot be seated at the feet of Jesus. Bring that from your, if you have daily prayer time and quiet time where you're connecting with the Lord, bring that with you into the busy things that you're doing after that, the things that you, you must do. We all have them. We un, so we understand that, but don't miss the whole point the way that Martha missed the whole point, the way that I missed the whole point when I was hosting that dinner years ago. And, you know, I, I sometimes, as, as I'm thinking about this, I, I, I remember that Jesus is telling us that people are more important to, than things, but he's also telling us that we're not valuable because of the things we do. We don't earn our status with him by accomplishing things. And we do get busy and distracted with many things, never, never more so than now, right? We've got technology, we have constant noise, we're used to a constant influx of information. You know, you can't even stand in line somewhere without feeling like I need to pull out my phone and be doing something, right? I need to take in something. I need some noise in my life. Maybe you have the radio on in the car and the television on while you're in the kitchen or, you know, we, we fill our lives with this incessant noise. But Jesus is inviting us to see that it's not about all this stuff that we're doing, the things that are distracting us. It's about him. And we need to be focused there on that relationship first and foremost. You know, one time um, years ago, my daughter Gabby was talking and talking and talking to me and she kept saying my name and saying my name. And I was doing, you know, what you do. I had my phone. I was looking at my phone. I'm like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Mama's listening. Mama's listening. But I wasn't looking up for my phone. And uh, finally, Gabby interrupted me and she said, no, mama, I want you to listen with your eyes. That was a real, uh, you know, come to Jesus moment for me. Like, okay, uh, sorry about that. Uh, but how many of us don't realize that, that 
in our relationships with the people that God puts in our lives for us to love, that's what they want too. They want us to listen with our eyes. They want us to look them in the eyes. They want to be seen. They want to be known. They want to be loved by us. And that's what really matters. That's all that matters. Jesus is inviting us to see that, to look at him, listen to him with our eyes, to turn to him in that way. To He's looking to interrupt us the way that he interrupted Martha. So we miss the whole point when we are focused on our things instead of relationships. So I want to encourage you, as you're thinking about this, consider what are your many things? Jesus told Martha, you're busy and distracted with many things. And he's saying the same to you. He says your name two times. He interrupts you in your things. What are the things? You're busy and distracted with many things. Only one thing is needful. So ask Jesus to tell you, what are your many things? What does he want to pull you away from? What does he want you to turn toward instead? How can you see that? How can you cultivate that habit of turning to Jesus inside your own mind, inside your own heart, even as you're very busy doing all those important things every day? And it is important. I get it. I mean, I'm not here to tell you not to do your things because we all know it's important to. And, you know, my own mom, who she she raised nine of us and uh, she's now a grandmother to I'm losing track. I think it's 44 now, grandmother to 44, great grandmother to three. I mean, this is a woman who knows about busy and distracted, who can relate to Martha, right? As someone who's busy in that way. And um, I always remember as a kid, whenever that gospel passage of Mary and Martha was read at church, always on the way home, my mother would say, yeah, I know it's fine and everything, but uh, I'm sure everybody was glad that they had a hot meal at the end of all that talking that day. (laughs) And it's true. Like these things we do are important and they're valuable and they're ways in which we love and give to our families. But Jesus is inviting us to recognize that we're not earning our status with him by doing all of the things. We cannot earn his love. He doesn't value us because of anything we do. He values you because of who you are. He made you worthy and he loves you because of who you are. Just He just wants you to be and he wants you to be with him. He's inviting you to find your rest in him. And doesn't that sound nice? Come to me you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He's inviting us to rest in him. And, you know, sometimes I think we, we women, especially because we're so busy and distracted and we're we're exhausted so much of the time that our prayer lives can feel like one more to do on our list. One more thing that we have to do. Another thing that we have to check off. And yet what Jesus is inviting us to see is that it's not another chore, It's what we're made for. And that in him, we find rest, we find peace, we find fulfillment. All those things that we say we're seeking, that we're striving after and running around, we find that in him and he wants to give us that. He wants us to sit at his feet and he wants to tell us that he values us for who we are, not for anything that we ever do. We can't earn his love by checking off all the items on our to-do lists. And, you know, I think it's important to reflect on the fact that Jesus also, he, he wants us to know that he wants to meet our needs. He knows our needs and he wants to meet them. So when I'm, I'm talking about this idea of coming to him and finding your rest, he knows you need that. He knows the ways in which you're depleted and exhausted and stressed and you have anxiety, whether it's about health or relationships or finances. He knows all about all those details and the things that are filling your mind. And he wants to give you peace. He wants to give you rest, even in the midst of all of that. He knows about that. Another gospel story I want to mention, especially as we're talking about Jesus knows and wants to meet your needs, is um, the gospel story of the woman with the hemorrhage. This is such a powerful and beautiful story. So I'm just going to read the little passage here. And there was a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians. And she had spent all she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I but touch his garments, I shall be made well. What a beautiful example of faith that is. And she was made well because she touched his garment. That's all she had to do. And, you know, when we look at this, I think this, this gospel um, 
story has great power and meaning for us as women, especially because this is a woman who is suffering uh, from an abnormal flow of blood. So here is a feminine illness, uniquely feminine, right? He could have cured somebody with a broken arm or somebody who had a high fever or, you know, whatever, and you know, leprosy. But he chose to heal this woman of this hemorrhage, which was a uniquely feminine form of suffering and that she had suffered for many years under the care of many physicians. And he meets her in this need. And I think this is so important for us as women to reflect on because he chose to meet this particular need. He chose to heal this woman of this unique feminine way of suffering. And what that speaks to us is the truth that Jesus knows the ways in which we uniquely suffer as women. May not be a hemorrhage for you, but there are ways we uniquely suffer as women. Remember that when Eve was in the garden, God told her, you'll bring forth children in great pain. And I used to think that just meant labor pain, but I've come to understand that what it means is that we women, every one of us, whether we biologically have children or not, every one of us is called to mother, not mother as a noun, but mother as a verb. St. John Paul II talks beautifully about the feminine genius and the concept of spiritual motherhood, that every woman is called to mother. That's our unique identity our unique gift that we're meant to use to bless the world, bless the people that God places in our lives, whether it's our own children, our husbands, our own parents, our coworkers, the people in our neighborhood, the people that we go to church with. We're called to mother. What does that mean? It means pouring ourselves out as a gift for others, using our natural feminine gifts of compassion, sensitivity, understanding, generosity, recognizing the needs of others and pouring ourselves out to meet them. And you know what Jesus knows? He knows the ways in which we uniquely suffer because that costs us. The ways we uniquely love others as women because we are women cost us greatly sometimes. Sometimes it's just because we're pouring ourselves out and it's not reciprocated. Sometimes we pour ourselves out and we don't see good fruit from the work that we're doing. Sometimes we're rejected by others. Sometimes it just costs us because we're exhausted and we're depleted and they're asking for more. They're always asking for more. Jesus is inviting you to see that he knows the unique ways you suffer because you are a woman, because you love with a unique capacity of self-gift because you are a woman. Inside of this gospel story, he's inviting us to see that. He sees you bring forth children in great pain. That means you bring forth life from others. You nurture the life of others at your own expense. That's what we're made to do. It's a beautiful gift. And yet it costs us. It can hurt sometimes. And we're weeping in that sometimes. The the last story I want to share very quickly, because I know we're we're coming up on time here, is the story of the widow of Nain. And when we talk about weeping, here's a woman who was weeping. This is a woman who Jesus met her needs before she even knew who he was. So we read, soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew nearer to the gate of the city, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. And when he saw her, he had compassion on her. And he said to her, do not weep. And he came and touched the buyer and the bearers stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak and he gave him to his mother. Now here was a woman who was in great need. She was a widow. Her only son had died. At the time, women couldn't own property. She was destined to be destitute as a result of this. This was a desperate situation when her only son died and Jesus knew that. And she didn't ask for Jesus's help. He sought her out, like we talked about in the first session. He went to her in her need, where she was hurting, where she was longing for him. And he comes to each one of us in that same way. And I love his simple words to her. And I want to invite you to reflect on that today. Do not weep. That's what Jesus says to every one of us. And we are all weeping whatever it is that you are suffering through, whether you're worried about money, whether you're worried about your health or the health of a loved one, worried about your relationships with family members, worried about your marriage, about your work, 
the things that cause us anxiety, that cause us pain, the ways in which we are uniquely suffering, especially the ways we uniquely suffer because we are women, because we love with that self-giving, life-giving, nurturing, pouring out of our very selves, which is uniquely reflective of Jesus's gift to every one of us on the cross. Because he sees us in that, he tells us, do not weep. He sees us in that pain and he wants to meet us there. He wants to meet us in every way that we have a need. He wants to go to us and meet us. So he's interrupting us the way that he interrupted Martha, the way that the, he healed the woman with the hemorrhage. He wants to see your needs and meet them. And he, the way he went to the, the widow before she even spoke to him, she probably didn't even know who he was. He knew her, he saw her, he knows you. He sees you. He wants to love you and he wants to meet your every need. And he's speaking those words to you. I want to invite you to think about the ways in which he might be calling your name, saying your name twice, like he did to Martha, loving you so patiently, interrupting you in your many things. The ways in which he wants to meet your particular needs. Can you meet him inside of your weakness? Can you meet him inside of the ways that you're suffering? He is waiting to meet you there. All right, we're going to close again with a, a moment of quiet prayer. And um, I'm just going to invite you to reflect during this time. What Ask God to tell you what your, what your many things are. Ask him to tell you what he's inviting you to. And ask him to connect with you. Be open to the ways in which he wants to connect with you in whatever it is that you find yourself needing and longing for this morning. Right in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of this time together. We thank you for the gift of your love. Please touch the hearts of each of us now. Speak to us your message of love and worthiness with words and understanding that can only come from you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle, so much. Uh, so many things for us to uh, digest and reflect on. Uh, again, I want to repeat that we've got that recording um, are going to be available for everyone because I think there's a lot there that we're going to want to dive in again um, ourselves. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Danielle. We're going to get into um, some questions now for Danielle. Uh, I'm sure we have even more things we may, may want to ask on some of the things you mentioned there, Danielle, or specific um, or other specific questions. So I invite everyone uh, now, if you've got some questions uh, in your minds or in your hearts from that, use that chat line um, and uh, we'll be Water, watching that, monitoring that. And uh, while that stuff comes in, uh, Danielle, I've got three more books that we want to hand away. Nice. <laughs> so, um, uh, and so I'll do the draw there. The, uh, the next three that I have is, um, one is uh, giving thanks and letting go. This is going to be a good one. Um, reflections on the gift of motherhood. Okay. And also for, um, as our kids grow up, I've got a question pre-submitted relating to uh, teens, Danielle. <laughs> okay. Uh, and an another a soft cover of uh, the You're Worth It book and a soft cover Momnipotent. Momnipotent. Awesome title. <laughs> okay. So I'll do the draw here. And we'll be sure to send those out. First name is Karen Lansing. Karen Lansing, I saw you on the chat bar. So we'll be sending a uh, book to you. Next one. Oh, I've got two here. All right. So this one, Genevieve Delacruz. 
Genevieve, congratulations. We'll be sending a book to you. And finally, the last one I had pulled out was Caitlin Boyd. Congratulations, Caitlin. We'll be sending that out to you. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's an exciting, uh, <laughs> a great way to share some of Danielle's words uh, within our little group here. So um, with that, I'm going to start off uh, watching for a few questions here. Um, Danielle, the first question um, I have for you, and this was uh, a few people had commented and it's kind of built as you gave your talk, is, is the question on prayer. So you have mentioned it a few times to pray about these things and that mm -hmm. we should bring these things to, to our prayer. But um, I want to get uh, really specific or practical that, that uh, million dollar question, how to fit it in or where to schedule or what does that even look like? So mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk to us about what that kind of prayer that you're suggesting would be. Sure. And uh, yeah, consideration to like with little kids or different chapters in life or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever you want to share on fitting yeah. prayer in. Yeah. I mean, first I'll say, I get it. I, I understand. <laughs> I, I understand the challenge. Um, but I, I want to challenge you back and say that there, you, you do have five minutes. Okay. Everybody has five minutes. And if that's all you have, I want to invite you to start there. If you don't know where to begin, you know, start with five minutes. It's, I, I understand the busyness. I understand the interruption of life when you're, you're caring for little people, especially, um, and, the, and, you know, the general business of every day. But I think too often we fall into the habit of like, this is my life. These are all my things, right? We're busy and distracted with many things. And then we're, then we look at our lives, like, where can I squeeze in prayer time in there, right? And then, and that's when we're thinking about it as like a box I need to check off. When really what, what God is inviting us to, in, in especially inside of the story that we just shared about Jesus and talking to Martha and Mary, is that what our relationship with him comes first. And then all the other stuff fits in around that. And so, I mean, of course, that's going to look different for different people, but I would encourage you to just look at your day where, where can you start with the five minutes? If you're not currently committed to daily prayer time on your own, start with looking for five minutes. Could you do it by getting up five minutes earlier? Could you do it in the evening? Could you do it on your lunch break? Could you do it during the baby's nap time? But whatever it is. I mean, it, and you know, if and people tell me all the time, like, I don't have time and I get it. I know it's, it's very possible to feel that way, but I, I encourage you to look at your, your daily life and what are, what do you think your priorities should be? And then what are your priorities? Like, how are you spending your time? Are you, you know, spending time each day scrolling through social media? There's nothing wrong with social media, at, you know, um, on the outside, but if it's replacing relationship with God, then if you're filling in all the moments of your day with, you know, those kinds of little distractions, maybe it's Netflix, maybe it's texting with friends, maybe whatever, whatever it is. Um, I, I encourage you to think about what, what it is that, um, that's pulling you away. What are your, your many things that you're busy and distracted with and look for the five minutes. And then once you make that daily commitment to the five minutes, um, uh, it's been my experience that it, it grows from there. You find yourself wanting more of it and making more space for it. And you come to realize I did have the capacity to do that. And it's not always going to be perfect and it's going to get interrupted a hundred times. And you can know that going in, but that doesn't, you know, discount the importance of, of making that commitment in the first place. And, uh, you know, and, and then I just encourage you to remember, it's not a chore. It's not something you're going to accomplish. You're not going to wow God with anything you go and do and say during your, your prayer time. It's not about that. You're not trying to impress him. You're doing this for you. This is what we're made for. We're, we're built for a connection with our creator. And so we find those things that we say we want. We want peace. We want balance. We want joy. We want lasting fulfillment. We're seeking all of these things. We're working so hard. We're striving so hard for all of them. And yet God is inviting us, especially inside the gospel passage we just looked at, to remember that we find all of those things and we know who we are, truly, honestly, who we are as precious daughters of God inside of that relationship with him. So we do need to be focused there. And yeah, you mentioned practically speaking, I'm a very practical person, like find your five minutes and then, you know, be practical about it. Maybe you're going to find your five minutes early in the morning. So, you know, set the timer on your phone put it away from you and spend those five minutes. If you don't even know where to begin, maybe you just want to spend those five minutes in quiet. We, we've been ending the sessions with a moment of quiet. I think we all need more quiet in our lives. We need more silence. Maybe you're going to spend those five minutes in silence and just 
place yourself in the presence of God. And then when your mind wanders and you start thinking about what to make for dinner or a conversation you had with your friend the other day, pull it back. And you know, don't judge yourself, just pull yourself back. And then when you get distracted again, pull it back and do that for the five minutes until it becomes a more cultivated habit in you. And then that way I find that even once you go about the busyness of your day, you're more able to bring that connection with God with you and be turning to him in all the big things and little things throughout your day. Thank you. That's awesome. Partway through your answer, I thought, oh, I was going to ask, like, what does it look like? <laughs> what does the prayer <laughs> time look like? But exactly as you say, like, those are the things and, and our minds do wander, but that's okay too, right? I guess that's exactly. part, of, part of it. Um, a question came in here. This is not even something that's going to take too long. Your book sounds so great. Someone asked, um, what's the availability audio books? Do you have some that are audio? Do you know, or? Yeah. Um, so of all the books, the only one that there's an audio version is you are enough. And I'm grateful that Ascension did, um, invest in, in making an audio version of that because I, I know that's how I prefer books as well. You know, you can take it in the car, you can go on a walk and, or you can listen with the kids. Um, but unfortunately that's the only one that's available in audio version. Audiobooks are great. And I, like I said, I love them myself, but they're a hard one for publishers, especially smaller publishers, especially smaller Catholic presses to profit from. So it's a big investment and then they don't get much of a return on it, unfortunately. So I, I think it's it's difficult. So like with my new book that's coming out, I'm, I'm not sure there's going to be an audio version. I'm in conversation with them about that now, hoping that there can be. Um, but, you know, understanding that there's there's a lot at play there. But um, but yes, You Are Enough is available and I am the one who who read that one. So you'll hear my voice on there. That's awesome. I was going to add that. Yeah, that you, it's your voice. So I feel like it's hanging out with Danielle and a book <laughs> as you listen. So that is really awesome. Um, another question I had sent here. Um, so a comment from a participant. I love listening to your girlfriend's podcast because of its honesty and vulnerability. And I really believe this helps other women learn and grow. Here's her question. It's fun. If you could change one thing since starting a family, do one thing differently because of the wisdom and insight you now have, what would that be? <laughs> oh boy. Okay. No regrets. No. <laughs> um, I don't know. Let's see if I could change one thing. I mean, you know what? I think that there's so much that I stressed about and worried about, especially when we were a younger family, the details of stuff like, and, and I, I understand doing it. Like it's part of, I think human nature, you care so much. And then you just stress all these little details, like how you're going to feed them and how you're going to educate them and all of these things. And I, I can realize now that, um, it, that it really more important than any of that stuff that we might do for our kids or the choices we might make about their, their food or clothing or education or activities. Like the most important thing is your relationship with your kids and um, spending time together is the most valuable thing. And so I think uh, if I could go back and, and tell myself to do something differently, it would be like, you know, forget about all that stuff. Like, you know, it's fine. You can, you research your stuff and try to make the best choices. Of course, that's important, but you know, it's, it's not in that at the end um, that our kids aren't these little science projects that we're going to get a grade on at the end of the day. They're, you know, they're living, breathing individuals that um, have their own free will. And that's a beautiful gift to every one of us. And so really the success inside of family life, I think is, is largely what comes from your relationship with each of your kids. And there's no replacement for just time spent together in cultivating that relationship. I think that's a really valuable investment. Um, so, you know, all of the other exterior things, they can come and they can go and some of them are great and some of them not so great. But I, I think the level of, at which I stressed about all the details, I think I can see now it, it wasn't, it wasn't necessary. And um, truly just being focused on your relationship with your children is the most valuable and important thing. It's awesome. <laughs> Great advice. 
Um, another question that had been sent earlier to me, uh, I hope you won't feel put on the spot. Uh, she said, seems like Danielle has it all. <laughs> so, um, but I'll expand. So like kids, uh, family life. Okay. But a career, um, as an author podcast, that's followed by many speaker. Okay. All of those things. And so her question was, I'd love to hear sort of, how does that happen? And I would like to add almost how, how to discern what to pursue pursue um mm-hmm. maybe you want to talk on family things but maybe let's talk even career we do have some women here who would who maybe aren't married or don't have children mm-hmm. but um how to discern what to pursue yeah. yeah that's a great question and it's one I get a lot um and uh I'm just going to encourage everybody who like and I get it because I'll look at some some women I know in real life or people that I follow online and be like how what like that makes no sense and I, I just everybody has their own unique calling. And so I I first would want to caution you to don't compare yourself to other people, but then with regard to discerning. So for me personally, like I I shared that we got married and started our family, right? Right. When I was done with school and um, all I wanted to do was be a wife and mom. Like I was work was not on my radar. It really wasn't something I, I wanted to focus on. And I just really wanted to be, you know, home with my family and we, we homeschooled and that was an important, you know, investment of my time. And yet um, circumstances change. And I was presented with opportunities. Like I said, I began doing a little bit of writing, mostly just for myself in the beginning. And it led to other opportunities. And then what I found was really important to do at, at every stage in that game, every step of the way where first I was just doing some freelance things that led to other, you know, part-time job opportunity, then full-time job opportunity, and then bigger jobs. Um, You know, every step of the way, just, I was always just in conversation with my husband, of course, very importantly. And we would just very prayerfully decide together, like, does this make sense? And can we make this work? And, you know, oftentimes the, the things that I would wind up saying yes to, it felt very much like this is, an opportunity that that has been presented to me. I wasn't necessarily even chasing it down. And so you can kind of discern God's will in that. Like, what are your, what are your skills? What are your gifts? What are your opportunities? What are your circumstances? And, you know, there are, thanks be to God, so many creative ways that families can get the bills paid these days, you know? And uh, so finding a way that makes sense for you and your family and and be open to the fact that it might change. You, you might commit to something and a year from now, it makes absolutely no sense. There are things we can't predict. The ways and the needs of our family can shift and change. Our parents might need us in new ways or some of your children might, or you might have more children. And so I think just being always open to, first of all, what, what God's will might be And that God speaks to you, his will through look around you, like who are the people who need you and what are your circumstances? What are your opportunities? What are your, your particular skills or inclinations that it's very, it's, it's not quite as complicated as we make it seem sometimes. Like we just have to look around to to realize like, what, what is God calling you to right now? Well, it's this, it's what's right standing in your living room. Right. And um, so recognizing that, but then being open to the fact that you may, you may need to change your mind. And that's, that's, you know, really an important part, I think, of family life and all the different big decisions we make inside of marriage and family life. It's important to be flexible and, and be open to changing your mind for sure through the years. There have been times when, you know, we've discerned, we've prayed and like, yes, I'm going to do this thing. And then, oh my goodness, that was a really bad idea. <laughs> like that's not working for us. So, you know, being open to that and recognizing, and, and I've realized as my family has shifted and changed, my kids need me in different ways. They don't need me in some of the other ways and that presents new opportunities. And so I think just being very aware of those things, but it's always been very important to Dan and me that our family come first. And so we, every decision, whether it's about his work or my work, we always make in the context of that, like what is best for us, what is best for our marriage and for our kids in the ways that they need us right now. So there's no one right size fits everybody, right? I, and so just recognize that um, and be very open to the unique ways that God might be calling you to live out your vocation to your marriage and family, especially. That's awesome. Thank you. Sometimes it's so helpful just to hear those reflective comments because you can look back on how things panned out and you can even make that comment. Oh, sometimes you just had to leave leave something behind that you originally thought was a good idea. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes reassuring to hear that for say someone who's in a position of thinking, I can't let something go or whatever, like the wisdom that 
it's okay. That might be part of the path. <laughs> exactly. I think that's really important because sometimes I think we can fall into the habit if you're if you're focused on work and you have work goals to um, like uh, almost out of a sense of fear. Like I can't say no to this thing because then I'm not going to get another thing, right? Like or um, but I think it's really important to recognize that you know God is a God of abundance and He wants to give and give and give to you. He wants to give you great abundance and joy in your life and, and in your work. And so you know, trusting in him is so important. And so sometimes letting go of something, and, it, and it's always really helpful for me too, when there's an opportunity and like, oh, this is such a great thing. But there's like, you know, when I talk with Dan about it and he's like, how on earth could we make that work right now? Like that is not happening, you know? And um, our, our husbands can be such a gift to us in that way because they have that uh, very, they have their own masculine genius, right? Their, their perspective, which is a balance to ours sometimes. But in, in those moments where I don't want to say no to something because it's so great. And yet I can, I can see and understand that it's not a good idea right now. Um, to, to know like my saying no to this is opening up that opportunity for somebody else. And that could fully be part of what God's, God's plan is for that particular work, that ministry, whatever good thing it is that you, you feel like you need to say no to as a, a sacrifice. It is a sacrifice um, for the betterment of your family, that that's opening that up to someone else and that God's not going to be outdone. Like there's another thing that he has in mind for you, something you may not have even ever imagined that he's going to be calling you to. And, and that's going to be down the road, perhaps. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, I've got another question here from our uh, chat bar. Uh, she loved your mom's point about how everyone, this is the Mary Martha story, oh, yes. how everyone at Mary Martha's house probably enjoyed that hot meal. <laughs> so it is needed, right? The busyness. So, so what true. are some practical suggestions for how to bring Mary's attitude, which Jesus praised, into our busy Martha moments or minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think first and foremost, it, you have to have established that daily prayer, the habit of daily prayer. That is the most powerful way to do it. Um, another very practical way to do it is, um, you know, pray your morning offering in the morning. If you're not familiar with it, Google morning offering, you'll see a little, a little prayer. It's just an easy way to give your day over to God at the start of every day. I, I um, have it printed up and put on the bathroom mirror to remind everyone to say in the morning when they're brushing their teeth. Um, but then what something that I've done that's really helpful is to kind of cultivate that habit of repeating that that offering prayer, that morning offering prayer in different moments of your day. You might you might anchor it and like, you know, say it again when you're driving the kids to school. You might say it again when you're making lunch or you might say it again when you're, you know, during your commute or whatever. Um, but then also inside of moments that you find especially challenging to remind yourself like, oh, you know, you're, you're hurt in some way, you're disappointed or discouraged in some way to like pray that again Again, and you know, very be very deliberate in choosing to give that to God, and um, you know, having that prayer memorized is, was really helpful to me, especially during busy years where um, I could interrupt myself in moments of, of my day, and it might be in the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, that's what you want to give Him is every single thing. When we we talk about our relationship with God, I like to remember that He's this loving parent, He's this loving Father, and I reflect on that in light of my own relationship with my kids. Like anyone who's a mom knows, there's like this pressure time when your kid's a toddler, right? And they're they're little and they're beginning to explore the world, but they're still coming back to you. You're you're their home base. You're their peace, their security, their that you're meeting all of their needs. And so whether they, you know, they're having a joyful moment and they'll turn to you in that moment, or they're they're hurt and they're they need you, they'll turn to you in that moment. Like there's a very natural relationship there where the child is turning to to you inside the good and the bad that happens to them in every moment. And that's how we're meant to be turning to God inside of the good moments, inside of the bad moments and inside of the everyday struggles and trials and different kinds of challenges that we might face. He really wants that very natural relationship with every one of us. And I find that the more you cultivate that, the easier it becomes. And if you feel like I just get distracted and I'm never going to think about him again until bedtime, um, you know, set an alarm on your phone or, or on your watch and just interrupt yourself and, you know, set it for four times during your day. And each time just pause and deliberately give your day to God, give whatever work you're doing, give it over to him. I think the more you do it, the more it becomes a habit. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Great tips. I love the idea of the uh, morning offering on the mirror. Yes. <laughs> no one can forget, right? <laughs> Unless Sneaky you skip brushing your teeth. with your kids and husband too. <laughs> Unless you skip brushing your teeth, but then we have another. <laughs> 
<laughs> You'll catch them. Um, the another question I have is all about uh, friendship. So you, um, yeah, of course, yeah, your podcast is is uh, entitled Girlfriends, and um, and you mention it just really briefly about um, our lady or Mary uh, quickly going to visit um, Elizabeth. So I'm just wondering if you can just expand even more on just the importance of friendship and maybe for women in particular, mm-hmm. and then what about the context that we're in now, pandemic, like a year and a bit in, and and even where we are um more restrictions like that kind of thing how can we sure how do we need friendship and how how can we build up friendship yeah um i'm, I'm glad you you mentioned the visitation again that, that is my favorite mystery of the rosary and we're going to pray the joyful mysteries here today so um i think that you know our lady sets an example for us of connecting with elizabeth and it's such a beautiful example for us as women because you know, Mary, she's just received this message from the angel that she's going to be the mother of God. And so, you know, if it were me, I, I would probably need some time to process that and like get my brain wrapped around that. But we, we read that Mary didn't do that. She went because she also heard from the angel that her cousin Elizabeth was pregnant. And she immediately saw that she had that need and went to her. And I love to reflect on that beautiful image of them embracing one another in that moment where they came together inside of their shared experience of motherhood was the, the real connection there. Like that was what was the foundation of their connection. And that's meant to be the foundation of the connection of all women. And that doesn't mean every woman's going to biologically have children, but every one of us, like I shared in in that second session is called to mother. We have that unique capacity for feminine love the feminine ways in which we we relate to the people and love the people that God has placed in our lives. And that's that verb, mother. And we, we are meant to connect with one another through that shared experience and encourage and support each other in ways that only we uniquely can. You know, everybody knows this. Like there are some things that as great as your husband is, he just, he's not going to meet the same, your needs in the same way that a good girlfriend is. He's, he's not, he's not meant to be that. Uh, so there are ways that we uniquely need each other. And yeah, we have to be deliberate about seeking that out sometimes. And we have to be deliberate also about avoiding some of the pitfalls because, you know, if you look at it, I think Satan has particularly targeted female friendships. And to me, that's a great compliment because what it means is we are so powerful and he knows that. And he knows the kind of strength and powerful force for the good that women can be when they band together and encourage and support each other toward their common goals and try to help one another to grow in holiness and love and encourage and support each other and affirm our gifts in one another. He knows that. And so I think that's why we're uniquely targeted sometimes inside of the the ways that we get distracted by competitiveness or jealousy or comparing ourselves with other people, that all of that recognize what those pitfalls are, that they're a distraction from the powerful force for the good that we're meant to be. And, you know, like you mentioned, now more than ever, we have to be more deliberate about it. I, we always have to be deliberate about it because, you know, our, our families and our work will take up all of our time and our space, but we need to be making time for one another. We need to be making space for one another. Look for the people in your life that God might be calling on you to be a gift to right now. You know, when we started, I was talking about that your presence here, even in this virtual way, is a gift to every other person who's present here. In what ways is God calling you to be that gift? In what ways does he want to give you the gift of the presence of other people in your life, other women especially? In what ways does he want you to grow in that connection with others and encourage each other along the way? I think if we reflect on Mary's example in the visitation and ask God, you know, in what ways do you want me to play that out in my life? He will not fail to show you the women in your life that he wants you to love and serve that way, that he wants you to be loved and served by as well. It's a, it's a reciprocal thing. So recognize the value and the importance of that and just the powerful force for the good that we are meant to be when we connect with one another. That's awesome, Danielle. It's so encouraging um, uh, to know that we can be part of such a, such a force. What a great way to yeah. look at that. 
Um, we are almost nearing our time. Boy, it goes fast because I'd love to hear more and more from you. But um, there is one more question in the chat bar, and I think it'll be our final one before we start to say the rosary. Uh, it says, um, how do you set up boundaries? This might be a pretty big, uh, sorry, boundaries to focus on family. Marriage mm -hmm. is the question. And I, you, we just mentioned now friendship, and we want to be deliberate about that. But I guess, yeah, boundaries on how to keep that balance. What are some yeah. We all need help with that. And I think women are especially bad at doing this because, and I know I struggle with it all the time. Like I want, I want to please everybody. I want to do all the things. I want to please everybody. I want to meet all the expectations. And I think that's really built into it, all of us. And what a gift that is to the people in our lives, but recognizing um, the importance of saying no to some things. Like, you know, during this time of COVID, many of us have been in lockdowns and things haven't, um, you know, the activities are usual things, all the things that we're usually busy and distracted with, many of them stopped, at, at least for a period of time. Many of them you were sharing with me, Sarah, things, things are locked down again. Um, so I think it's a unique opportunity for us to reflect on, well, when things go back to normal, if ever they do, right, um, that like, what are the things that are actually important to me? and to my family for us to continue doing? What things have we put aside that maybe we don't need to pick back up again? What things are we doing that aren't really serving our needs as a family? What things are we doing just because everybody else is doing them or because we want something, you know, after school activities or something? What, what space in your life would, would your family maybe benefit from having open space? And, and, you know, like I was sharing that time spent together, unscheduled time that you spend together, downtime that you spend together as a family. In what ways do you need to say no to some things? And, you know, I had a friend recently remind me that no is a complete sentence. So when you're saying no to somebody for something, so often we feel like I can't say no because then I have to explain, right? I have to say because of this, because of that, I have to justify the reason I say no. But, you know, I learned this very powerfully in um, a, a good friendship that I have where I was asking something from somebody and she did just say no in a complete sentence, not rude, not in a mean way, but just no. And I realized, oh, you know, that's it. Like <laughs> you can just say no, or, or, you know, if you're not comfortable just saying no to something, if someone's asking something of you, you can say like, that's not going to work for me right now. And that's it. You do not have to explain why it's not going to work for you. You do not have to explain that you just want your Tuesday afternoons completely free. It's fine, you know, that you're allowed to do that. And um, the other tip I might share is, you know, talk to your husband about it. Um, it's, it's really good to get in the habit of before you commit to something, whether it's an activity you're going to sign up for your kids or a, a new work project or whatever, um, to ask ask your husband what he thinks of that situation and just get in the habit of saying, you know what, let me check with my family and, and see, or let me check my schedule and, and see, and just buy yourself that time and then check in with him because there are, there are times where you just need that outside perspective. And uh, like, I, like I shared, our, our men are, are such a gift to us because they can give us that. Uh, so many times I feel like my husband's rude because he'll just say something, you know, and in a way that I never would, I would like couch it in all of these emotional terms and explain it all the way where it's just like, no, you just need to communicate this message. Like that's, that's actually not going to work for me right now. Or I can't commit to that right now. Like, I don't know. This is like being a grown up, right? <laughs> we need to learn these very basic things sometimes. And if you decide together with your, with your husband or with your family, what your priorities are, then it, it becomes very easy because you're saying no to that thing. You're saying no to that commitment, but what you're actually doing is saying yes to the beautiful gift that is your marriage, that is your vocation, that is your, your motherhood in your family life. That's awesome. Thanks. Thank you, Danielle. So many, so many great tips, uh, so many practical ideas, um, but we are going to have to uh, complete the Q&A part right here. Um, and uh, we'll start to say the rosary in just a moment. Um, I just want to say, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do a final wrap up right at the end, but we've just been really um, just so blessed, Danielle, to have you here with us and that you could be the reason that so many of us have gathered together. And just to reflect on all these things, I feel very encouraged, uh, really enriched, and just I know there's more things I can go back and reflect on. And uh, I'm just really thrilled that uh, I know many, many, many women can have heard of those wonderful things and, uh, and kind of know next steps or things to, to pray about, think about. So that is just really so awesome. With that, everyone, that is um, the 
full program for this morning. And I just, and y'all stay here. I want to uh, thank you uh, with a really uh, such a heartfelt thanks for you being with us, uh, guiding us in these really wonderful thoughts and in prayer and uh, really building a new connection. I think with all these women that have gathered, we're kind of renewed, I hope in, in this connection. And I, yeah, just want to really thank you for oh. for coming and being with us in this way. Absolutely. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. I've loved being here with you today. It's a gift. It's an honor and a privilege to have joined together with you in this way. I was praying for the women in, as we were preparing and planning for this day. And I'm going to continue to hold you in prayer that, um, that you will continue to grow closer as a community and encourage and support each other in all the ways that God is calling you to. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of your day. You're welcome. And we will bear you in our prayers to Danielle and your wonderful ministry and the efforts you, uh, you make in your, your podcast and your, your uh, talks and in your books. And we look forward to uh, reading books here that, um, and we'll just uh, feel a new connection with you as we read your words for sure. So with that, to all of our participants, I just want to say again, thank you, as Danielle had said, how wonderful that you took the time to be with us. And uh, thank you because your presence here is an encouragement for all of us. And um, I want to uh, thank you on behalf of FFI that you would participate. I want to give you a heads up. You'll probably receive some emails afterwards, of course, sharing the uh, recording that we have of this event. And um, by all means, utilize that recording to uh, share and encourage um, others. If you think that there's something you heard that was very relevant to a friend, don't be shy to uh, just forward that on to them and just say you were thinking of that friend in that particular moment. You know, those sorts of things are so helpful. So uh, watch your email for um, recordings and uh, and any follow-up emails. We'd love to stay in touch with you over the ne next several months here, having had this great uh, connection. So with that, I want to just thank you all and bid you farewell. Thank you and goodbye.